You're listening to The Vint Podcast, where we bring you interviews and stories from around the world of wine and spirits. From winemakers and critics to sommeliers and master distillers, we'll explore the people and businesses who are instrumental in shaping the future of today's food and drinks culture. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Vint Podcast. My name is Brady, joined back in studio with by Billy Galanko. How are you doing, Billy? Yeah, glad to have you back. You had to take the, the whole week off morning the Orioles, huh? I know, it's kind of tough. If uh, anyone watches on video, I have my Orioles, uh, Adley Rutschman, um, picture back behind me in the in the frame. And yeah, it's been a it's been a tough week. I have my little uh, Orioles baseball helmet uh, hanging uh, there to, you know, get it ready for next season. It'll be waiting. That's all right. You guys gave but, hope to everybody like like me who root for bad baseball teams that someday their team might be good even for a little while. <laughs> so, that's right. Cool. Yeah, I mean, well, so you were, be good. we'll be good for the next couple of years. So, yeah. Um, so switching over to to what we're talking about, we have a pretty cool interview coming up today with um, Michael Minio. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, from the French Laundry that that Brady kind of set up, which I'm really excited to kind of dive into and share more about um, for him. But um, you want to talk a little bit about, I guess, what you were doing last week, and then you're actually not going to be able to join. We're we're recording this ahead of time, so this is before we've chatted with Michael. Um, and we're just excited about it. Do you want to talk about what you're going to be doing this week and where you'll be and kind of what you've been up to? Yeah, it'll be at a be at a conference this week in Napa Valley um, for our investment side of the business. Um, kind of was a little bit of an impromptu travel. So yeah, it wouldn't be on the, uh, on Michael's interview, but really excited for that. I mean, he's started as an apprentice at the French Laundry in 1998 and is now the general manager. So he has a lot of French Laundry history and per se history under his belt, which for folks who are into the culinary American culinary scene. And I mean, global, really, those are restaurants mm-hmm. that, you know, are known around the world and really put um, French cooking in the U.S. on the map. So um, it's awesome. And their wine program has come a long way as well. So that'll be a cool conversation for you guys to have. Look forward to listening to it. Um, <clears throat> last week, we were in <laughs> Vegas for a similar um, conference for the investment side of our business. And kind of the wine thing that we got to do was um, attend the Frank family vineyards, um, 30th anniversary celebration that was had, uh, in Vegas, at, um, one of the hotels on the why, strip or one of the resorts on the strip. Why was yeah. it in Vegas? I didn't even think about that. Um, why was it in Vegas? I believe they done a couple of these kind of like 30th anniversary dinners. Um, like, I think they also had a celebration back in California as well. Um, but is they it were just because of the, yeah. the high concentration of like wine people? Because like Vegas has one of the, you know, the highest concentration, I think, of master psalms working or like, you know, just of high quality wine um, in the yeah, US. It was one like, of the highest concentrations. It was kind of across the spectrum. It was a lot of like friends and family, mainly like friends. So I think it was a central location as well. I actually didn't get all of hmm. the, all of the details. Um, one of our, you know, our colleague is family friends with the Frank family. And so got to tag along. Um, but that was really cool to, to meet uh, Rich Frank, um, the rest of their family, and to kind of hear about uh, each of the wines they were had with dinner. It was great food. Um, and we had their Zin, uh, two, two Zinfandels and two cabs from them. And then their special uh, 30th anniversary Brut Rosé, which I believe they did like 55 cases or something of um really good yeah it was solid um so that was enjoyable uh the rest of the wine experiences while eating uh dining in la were lackluster but um prices were a little expensive we were heads down heads down on business so we weren't splurging a whole lot yeah. by la you meant las vegas lv las but yeah vegas. um <laughs> what, what what was in that brute rosé um, I actually don't remember the variety. If I recall, it was like five or seven years on the lease, I believe. Mm. 
Oh. Um, yeah, it was one of the better sparkling rosés that I've had here at Stateside. I mean, I've had, I mean, I did, I've had like Argyles and Shramsburg and like some of the big names like that. And those are really solid. Um, but yeah, this was a cool surprise because I didn't know that they made such high quality wines out of that part of their portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're really good. Yeah. So all the wines really were, were top notch. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I tend to find U S based new world, well, particularly U S based sparkling wines, especially rosés to kind of be a little more fruit forward and a little less lean. So that's always cool when you can find one that has more yeasty and, um, other characters yeah. notes to it. Definitely was like, it had, it had really great fruit, but it did have that yeasty characteristic and it, and it was, um, like, yes, I definitely call it full bodied for sure. Um, I'm trying to think now it might've been, might've been Pinot Noir because we did have a Pinot Noir too. I think I said we had the Zin in the cab, but we did have a Pinot. So it wasn't their own, um, their own fruit. Um, that was actually across their wines. That was something I didn't quite pick up on. There weren't, um, we didn't have like detailed notes at the tables. It was really just like, uh, rich coming up and, and sharing. And so, uh, if you were focused on the, what was in front of you, some of that was missed. Um, it was a long day. I was up for 23 hours, I believe that, <laughs> that night before. So it was a long two days. Nice. Well, my, my only sparkling experience this weekend, I had, um, a sparkling Mondeuse, which is, um, typically a grape grown kind of in the Savoie region, um, of France, which is kind of mountainous. If you, if you kind of know where Jura is, it's, it's right next door. It's connected. It's kind of mountainous. So that was crisp and lean and fun and simple. Wasn't, wasn't as, uh, it's probably the opposite of your wine, but it was cool. It's a rare, a rare grape. And then, um, yeah, well, that was exciting. It's exciting that you had that. I was just thinking about some of the other uh, sparkling wines or producers that we were going to have on. And um, yeah, I, I would never have thought about a Napa Valley producer randomly having that at their uh, 30th anniversary. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, we should have a, we should have Schramsberg on. I like them. And it's hard to tell this. You can't really tell the story of sparkling without, in the U.S. at least, I mean, without mm -hmm. them. Yeah, they were the, when I first started doing my studies, they were the ones everybody's like, if you want a benchmark of U.S. Yeah. sparkling, check out Schramsberg. Um, on, on another random note, um, I guess this, I'll, I'll walk everybody through my, my logic here, but Mondeuse made me think of my wine book, the, the grapes book, which also made me think of the Oxford Companion to Wine. And um, like a little tease, we have one of the editors, the new edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine is out. Um, and we have one of the editors, Julia Harding, MW, coming on. Um, Jan says Robinson was busy. But as, as a fun little aside, I was telling Brady this actually offline. They offered um, to send a book plate to me ahead of time that was signed by all the editors. So I was like, oh, that's really cool. I thought for some reason I thought book plate meant the, a whole book free. Um, so I was like, oh, thanks. I'm really excited. I, I remember buying my first edition after going to the New York Public Library um, many times just to to read the book originally. Um, and it turns out a book plate is not a book and it's also not the inside cover of a book, which is what I thought a book plate might be. So I got like a, a two by two, like kind of postage stamp today um, in the mail signed by all of the editors, with just, just their names and a nice little card that said, you know, thank you and um, enjoy reading. But uh, that was quite the random development. But now I have a, a postage stamp signed by Jancis Robinson and a couple NWs. Yeah, get that. Um, get to buy the actual copy now. Put together a little shadow box, frame it all up with a green mat in the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really like spiced it up a bit. Yeah, no, I guess I really am. So, but I'm looking forward to getting the the second. I don't know if it's the second edition, but the latest edition. Um, the first one was so great, so um, it will be replacing this. So, get ready for our interview with Julia. Um, coming up in a few weeks, I guess. It's probably closer to a month, but um. Cool. Other other updates from my side. Um, for those who don't follow me on LinkedIn, unlike Brady, I don't have a giant LinkedIn following, but I posted a while back that I, I did pass the um, 
certified scotch professional um, exam by the, the Council of Whiskey Masters. So I'm continuing my scotch education, which is very exciting. And, and as part of that, I, I went to a, um, a whiskey dinner this last week for the Glen Scotia whiskey dinner. Um, and the master distiller was there and we got to taste uh, five, well, four different expressions as well as like an intro cocktail. Um, so that, that was really neat. Um, I don't think I've expressed my love on here, but I'm a big fan of, uh, Campbelltown is like one of my favorite regions in all of Scotland. Um, after I went to Edinburgh the first time I had tasted while I was there and one Campbelltown whiskey stood out to me. And then I kept telling everybody, I didn't know it was like a cool small region to like. Um, but ever since I've, I've been into it. So for those who don't know, Campbelltown is, um, a whiskey producing region at the very bottom of a peninsula in Scotland. And right now it only has three active distilleries. There are some that are in the works to get started again, but it was like the hub of whiskey making in the late 1800s. Like it was like called the whiskey capital of the world. And then it went downhill and, and over time um, either fell out of style. There, there's a bunch of different reasons. Um, you can check out an article. I have an article. If anybody wants it, I'll share a link to it um, that I wrote. Um, but basically there's three left and they've been producing stuff in really cool ways. So this was neat. Um, I don't think they did it on purpose, but each wine whiskey we had, except for the very last one was, uh, finished in different sherry casks. So one was a PX, one was finished in an Oloroso cask and one was finished in an Amontillado cask. So, um, that was really cool. It's kind of like a, an experience both between the whiskey and also the influence, um, the Campbelltown style, I guess the Glen, Glen Scotia style. Um, yeah. and then being, how was the Amontillado? Ask, I, I don't know. I've definitely had, um, PX and Oloroso, but. I don't think I've had one finished in Monteado. It was cool that that one. I I was looking forward to that case that that um that case cask influenced the most, but they also that was one of their lightly peated expressions. So I got more peat than anything. Um, but it, it was definitely like a little brighter and a little bit more like herbaceous overall. And I don't think that was just the peat. Um, I'm also kind of like going through and revisiting all my fortified wines here as well. So I, I was just drinking an Amontillado, like actual sherry before going and tasting the difference between Oloroso. And I think you're able to get some of the, those, those Fino characters or the stuff that comes from its time where it's under floor um, before it, you know, comes over and becomes oxidized and becomes an Amontillado. So I think, um, I, I definitely think you could do it. It's a nice, it's a lighter expression. It's a little bit more lean rather than rounded that you get from like the Oloroso and definitely more than like the, the PX. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I imagine that the, I mean, I haven't done a ton of exploration in like with different finishing casks and stuff in the scotch space as much as I have in, you know, American whiskey or bourbon. But I imagine it takes a little bit, of, um, a little bit of time and discernment to differentiate between some of that so when you have a heavy peat influence. I think that gets pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, if if they're all peated expressions, then it's easier because you're still apples uh, apples, sure, and you're like not, the yeah. variation can be this. But if the other ones aren't peated, then you're like, yeah, trying to dive in to f get that whiskey or the cask influence. So, so I mean, that was interesting. And then it ended up with um, a 25 year uh, Glen Scotia, which was was cool. Um, definitely the highlight of, highlight of the show there. Um, and that was just basically straight. So that was uh, not straight, but you know aged traditionally and i think it was a sherry cask but it was basically a long time and on un, yeah not finished anything so <laughs> it yep, was good yep yep nice um great well shall we all right quickly for the what we were drinking this weekend i'm gonna keep this going until i i want to <laughs> until we can't do it anymore um so what <laughs> we're doing this weekend is going to be another one that's just personally on on my mind and my passion for this time of year and i don't know why fall makes me think of this but we're going to do Mosul Riesling this week, but it's going to be the Spätlese. Actually, it doesn't have to be Mosul. It'll be German German Riesling Spätlese. So it's that Spätlese literally means later harvest. Spät means late. Um, so it's like you have your cabinet, your Spätlese, and your Auslese. So it's kind of like the middle the middle of the picks um, for Riesling. They tend to be have a little bit of residual sugar, but are balanced always by amazing acid. So the ABV is typically like 9%, 10%. So you can have a couple glasses and, you know, it's totally fine. Um, and they're just like, when you get the ones with like some botrytis and a little bit of age on it, well, by age, I mean, I, I prefer like closer to 10 years if possible as like a starting point. Five, you'll start to see it. They get this like ginger, saffron, all of those fun 
kind of botrytis flavors on top of like some apricot. And it, it, for me, it just kind of tastes like fall flavors and it works so well with like any of the the different like turkeys or any, any of the fall foods you're going to have, even, even like sweet things. Um, it can kind of balance all of that out and the acid always cleans up everything. So everybody start having some, some straight lays of Rieslings. Um, if you don't know which one to get, I would ask somebody, but they're, they're pretty a good. The best ones a are good. Great. A good move with a uh, honey baked ham, maybe. Yeah, because both so. both the acid and the sugar would offset some of the uh, the fatty if the you fatty. if you do have a fatty yeah. one, and also the the salt and the and the sweetness that's on the honey, mm-hmm. depending on what bite of the ham you get. Um, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it works the with ch- all of it. The chunky, sugary brown part at the top. <laughs> it would still work. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool. So I had to get that out there. Do you want to get to our Introing sure. our interview, I would say Brady won't be joining the interview, but he is the inspiration behind it and did all the work to get the French Laundry on the line. So <laughs> we are happy to have them. Yeah, uh, Michael's a exciting guest for me because I've been wanting to have someone from the, you know, one of really the flagship, like I said, kind of benchmark fine dining establishments in the U.S., and Michael's been at the French Laundry since 1998. Like I said, he started as an apprentice. He became captain and had so much success there in the front of the house that when Keller opened per se in New York, he went over to train the front of house staff and was there for eight years, I believe, till he came back to the French Laundry where he's now the general manager. And so obviously has worked very closely with Chef Keller and the teams at both locations for some time. And I know they have a I just heard and read that the two restaurants have a fairly symbiotic relationship. Um, So I think there's probably a wealth of information that Michael has about uh, not only service and uh, fine dining and sort of what those two restaurants have meant in their respective areas, um, you know, to, um, to New York and the Bay area or Napa, I guess, but also to just the evolution of the wine programs and the beverage programs overall. Um, I know when we had Bobby Stuckey on, he talked about the French Laundry's wine list in the early 2000s, which was when I believe he was there around 2000, 2001, um, and sort of how it went from being very California centric list to much more globalized. So interested to hear you guys talk about that. And I think it'll be really interesting for our listeners. Um, so, yep, today's guest. And Billy, if you want to add anything else, um, we can. We can go there. Otherwise, are you good? Yeah. No, I was just going to say I'm excited because it's we've had like Andre Houston Mack and we've had Bobby Stuckey and we've had people who have like worked there um, and talked about the influence of the restaurant, you know, on them. So it's going to be cool to see somebody who's, you know, was there for so long or has been there in the early days and is now back and is basically like helped cultivate this environment that they all raved about. So I'm really excited for that. Yeah, so many so many quality folks come out of this ecosystem. So interested to hear from someone who's been there for so long and um, obviously has had almost every role you can have, it sounds like, in the front of house between the two locations. So um, enjoy Billy's conversation with Michael Mineo of the French Laundry and Thomas Keller's Restaurant Group. All right, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. You got it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, this is something um, I think our our audience has heard us talk about the French Laundry in numerous times and also per se has come up through, you know, both past guests and also just through friends of the program who live in New York. So we're really excited to have you on to be able to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit on both of those. But uh, before we dive in, can you tell us a little bit more about kind of who you are and how you got into the mix in both of these restaurants? Sure, be happy to. I, um, you know, I started at the French Laundry back in 1998. I got a job um, in the kitchen, so I was um, I went to college um, at University of Cincinnati, and I was um, headed to law school. And I kind of took a break between undergrad and and going that route, and started cooking at one of my father's restaurants, the Barrichello Inn. And um, you know, the next thing I knew, I I had a um, kind of like an internship set up at the French Laundry. Um, and I packed all my things and moved out here from Cleveland, Ohio and, and um, you know, started in the kitchen. And then um, a few months later, I was offered a full-time position 
and I uh, was a chef for about three and a half, four years. And then I moved to the dining room um, where I worked a couple different positions here. Um, and then um, towards the end of 2003, I, I moved to New York City and opened Per Se. And I was there till 2012. And then I came back to the French Laundry to be the general manager in 2012. So over 25 years now here, my whole adult life. Wow, that's incredible. Can you, <laughs> I'm sure the move from Cleveland to Napa was, was difficult for the weather and stuff. You probably missed Cleveland a lot. Yeah, though. horrible. It was terrible. I I, uh, I remember <laughs> pulling up and I didn't know places like this existed in the U.S. So it reminded me of Burgundy for sure. I had been a few times and mm -hmm. um you know, and even Bordeaux to a certain extent, but, um, you know, it was definitely a far cry from, from Cleveland. <laughs> um, can you, I guess for our listeners, like I've, I've, I think we've mentioned uh, the French Laundry and in, in, in the past and per se, but can you talk a little bit about what, what it is and, and what makes it special and then also what it was like back then? Um, and then we'll talk about how it's evolved over time. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've I've um, gotten to see quite a bit of, of change and evolution th through my time. Um, you know, a good re good resource is the cookbook too. So the French Laundry Cookbook came out in 1988, and um, you know, you look back at some of those dishes now, and and um, you know how refined they are that we serve today. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good reference point. Um, and then obviously the the newer cookbook too. Um, but it, you know it was it was um, it was so different, but yet very similar to to how things are are today for sure. I mean, um, you know, the the most important thing is taking care of the guests and making people happy, and um, you know that's pretty much unchanged. And and how we get there has definitely changed through the years for sure. So what, what was it? So today, like, you know, just setting the scene, it's one of the, the premier restaurants, I guess, in the United States as a whole, and if not the world. Um, back then, was it still just, was it a hot spot among, uh, you know, people coming up from the Bay and in, in the area? Or was it still one of those kind of destination type restaurants? Yeah, I mean, the Fr so the French Laundry opened in, in 1978. Uh, Don and Sally Schmidt mm -hmm. were the original um, proprietors. And it was booked since then i mean it, it you it was it was really hard to get a reservation since the moment it opened um you know they, they ran it from 78 to 92 and then thomas took it over and reopened in 94 and and you know it it continued that um you know difficulty to get into you know obviously chef keller refined it to a whole new level and almost you know kind of refined Fine, fine dining, you know, throughout, throughout our country, the U S um, you know, back then it was, it was uh, Thomas, Chef Keller, Charlie Trotter, um, Boulay in New York city, kind of blazing the trail for uh, where we are today. Um, you know, and then there was a, the, the big, uh, a couple of huge things along our journey, you know, was the, Esquire magazine. We were named um, um, John Mariani. He dined here the second night we opened, and 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 named the French Laundry, wow. you know, top new restaurant. Um, you know, and then the James Beard Awards, of course. And then in 1997, we had a, a a pretty monumental article in the New York Times from Ruth Reichel, who um, wrote a feature on the French Laundry and called it the most exciting place to eat in the United States. And that was kind of like, we were already, it was already maximum, but then it was like, that's when the waiting list kind of just tripled and quadrupled. And, um, you know, we saw a lot more um, international guests. Um, you know, we brought a lot more mm -hmm. attention to, to Napa Valley from, from, um, you know, all, all, all places. I mean, the New York times, this is all pre, internet pre social media pre you know any of that so the the, the newspapers right. were the the means to get the word out and and 
you know, I just, I even remember myself reading that article in the Cleveland Public Library on the old, you know, microfiche. <laughs> Um, cause mm -hmm. there was nothing, there was no book. There was, there was, there was very few articles, um, you know, and, and it's just hard to get, it's hard to get accessibility to that stuff. Um, so that article was kind of a, a, a monumental article for sure, you know, and then all the awards happen, you know, the world's 50 best, um, you know, we, we came in number one there and, and, um, you know, all various, you know, and then eventually Michelin came to the U.S. You got the Michelin Awards, the, the San Francisco Chronicle, Forbes, Five Star, so on and so on. Yeah, wow. That's, I guess, I guess it kind of became like an avalanche um, after after they started coming. Um, when When you first started, what would you say... So I guess the guest has always been the the core focus of of the restaurant, regardless of the cuisine or or the wine program. But outside of that, what would you say? Like when you started, what was the focus in terms of I guess both wine and and food? And then over your time before you left, per se, how had that changed? And then we can kind of advance. Yeah, in, I mean, you know, definitely there. when I when 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 I started, the focus was the food. I mean, the the entire property was set up for um you know the food the the um, what was on the plate there was you know french laundry had um, no artwork back then we played no music um you know wow. it was it was um very much um you know f food menu cuisine driven and you know we had you know we still have but one of the most incredible chefs American for sure, um, in Thomas. So, um, you know, and it's definitely led by the cuisine, you know, and then, and then through time, you know, we, I mean, we didn't have a sommelier for a while. So, I mean, even when I started, there was no sommelier, um, Laura, Laura Cunningham, who, you know, is, was our general manager, our, our original general manager, you know, still with us today, you know, was, was running the wine program and, you know, that there were a lot of things happening that, you know, at, at that moment in time, we, we needed to get somebody who could, um, you know, be in charge of that um, branch of the restaurant as we continue to grow and evolve um, for the future. I mean, we had, you know, so many projects working on uh, per se was one, obviously our own wine modicum. We started that in 2000. Um, you know, that was a big project. We needed somebody to help Laura with that. Um, so those are pretty two main wine focused things we needed to, to, to have, um, you know, per se planning started. I remember 99, maybe when I first got here. Uh, we're already working on that oh. project and it opened in 2004. Yeah. So it was that when you were working on it, that was kind of more wine was integrated from the, from the ground up. And that was, you were basically developing the, I guess the ambiance or what, what were we? No, I'm just saying so in the, I was in the kitchen kind of back then. So, you know, working on back then we yeah. were like over looking at plans for the kitchen mm -hmm designing i had i haven't i personally hadn't gone into the um, dining room yet but um just opening that restaurant knowing that we needed to you know knowing what i know now is you know we had to develop that whole wine program you know almost as you know a few years after but the french laundry wine program you know really wasn't developed fully until bobby bobby stuckey came here our first sommelier was a gentleman mm -hmm. named Dan Dawson. Um, and he was here for about a year, year and a half. And then, um, you know, it really wasn't until Bobby that the, the, the wine program at the French Laundry, like, kind of um, took off. And, and you know, he was um, really a, you know, dedicated professional who could, um, you know, do that pull the focus from Laura. She doesn't have to worry so, about that so much. 
Yeah. I was going to say, so when we spoke with Bobby, he was talking about, and I'd love to get your perspective on, I guess, taking, taking a step back away from the wine and looking at the, the broader picture. What was the, uh, what struck you the most that was like unique kind of when you met um, Chef Keller and kind of like, what are some of the core tenants that you, you guys kind of instill, instilled both in the French laundry and then were like essential to carry over to per se, kind of that DNA? Well, I mean, you know, I think the, the, the biggest thing at the French laundry is the, is the, um, um, you know, unpretentious, unpretentious nature of, you know, how we, how we treat people. And, and, um, you know, obviously Laura was a big part of that. And, and then Thomas with the food is the same, you know, our food is extremely relatable. It's not, um, you know, it's, 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 there's no mystery. It's, it's pretty, you know, um, easy for all of us to, to see what's on the plate. I mean, we, we can all go to restaurants all over the place and they serve you something from, I don't know, some remote island off the coast of Japan and it's the specific type of cuisine or whatever. And I, I have no idea if it's, if it's executed correctly or not, because I have no idea what that cuisine tastes like, you know, but we all know what a good, good <laughs> yeah. piece of meat tastes like, or a, a lobster or shrimp or, um, so the food has always been very, um, approachable, relatable, yet, you know, very, um, technical and um you know one of the biggest thing big things about thomas is he, he's he's the most intelligent chef i've ever worked with he his knowledge is um hmm. unmatched from a anyone um you know so many chefs i've i've come in contact with in my career but um chef keller definitely has a a, a, a knowledge depth that is um great and and so you know being able to tap into that resource uh, for the cuisine is is great. Is it a, a depth of knowledge just in? I guess you're saying it's everything. So is it like it's not just like technique? Is it flavors? Is it technique? Is it flavor? You know, how, how did it differ? I guess regionality. Um, you know our menu. We change our menu every night. So the first night we opened, we had a very difficult service and they all sat around the, the um, pass in the kitchen and said, we're going to rewrite the menu for tomorrow. And we've been doing that 30 years later, every day we change the menu. We all sit around the pass, the chefs meet after service, they go through the right. menu, write it for the next day. Um, so it's, it's constantly changing, constantly evolving, um, you know, always trying new things or, or uh, perfecting dishes, um, you know, and so pulling in that, in all those resources for sure. As a, as a young chef, what was the most exciting part of, of working there when, when you started in, in evolving over time? Oh, I mean, all the other people, I mean, the, 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 you know, I, I, I can't, um, the, the, um, incredible people I worked with it, 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 you know, I mean, I, I started when Grant started like a week, a couple weeks before me, we kind of started at the same time, Eric Zeevold, you know, Stephen Durfee. I mean, just like so many great chefs and um, talented individuals. And that was just in the kitchen. And then in the dining room, you know, I, I kind of got a whole new um, group of, of friends and colleagues that I met, you know, and seeing how, how, um, how they've all, you know, moved forward through their career. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of, a lot of people compare it to, I mean, it, it's kind of hard to compare, but there's either, kind of like a sports team where like there's either a coach or a player, like a, a university that produces just amazing, um, people and like they go on to have their own great careers, but it's basically like there's a lot of talent that kind of comes there and then it's just kind of honed and, and kind of springboard. Sure. From, I mean, from we use people. that analogy here too. So, I mean, it's not, not far off. Is that how you guys attract new, new people or people that like, I, I guess, how, I guess that's an interesting kind of question there. It's like, if there are people with so much talent, how do you convince them? Like now's not the time to start your new thing. You should come and work with us for a while before you kind of, 
move on or is is that not a hard based on your reputation not a hard Kind of yeah, I mean, no, I mean, we 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 definitely, you know, attract great talent, and you know, I mean, this is like, you know, the French Laundry is is um, it, every day is is almost like a new day, you know. We 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 have, um, you know, honed everything over the past thirty years, and tonight's service will be the best we ever have. Um, you know, the the food will never be better. The service will never be better, and it's it's just pulling from all those all those um, past experiences, past people, past team members, mm-hmm. um, all giving us this knowledge. And then tomorrow night will be even better because we'll be able to draw from tonight. And you know, if you're if you're passionate about this profession, um, there's really no there's really no better way. I mean, or place to be. I mean, the the, the um, the setting, the environment, um, you know, it's, it's pretty special. It's pretty unique. Um, and then you're surrounded by, you know, 150 like-minded people. So, um, you know, that's also, you know, when I first started in restaurants, it was, it's an afterthought, you know, it's, you're an actor or writer, you know, Mm -hmm. doing something to, to pay the rent or, or get by and, and it's it's good to see now that it's 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 a true profession. Yeah. How, how have you seen that change? I guess in that same time, there's been the rise of, you know, celebrity chefs, celebrity sommeliers. Have, have you seen that impact either this or also even opening per se, too? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, celebrity chefs, celebrity sommeliers. Yeah, I, I, I see that. I mean, the, the thing about the French Laundry per se is, you know, we're, you know, it's a, it's busy. We're a busy restaurant. It's um, a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. Um, so you're kind of, we're kind of like in our own little thing. We're in our own little bubble and, mm-hmm. and we are, um, you know, we, you know, not really too much broadcasting what we're doing, but we're just trying to like make a difference each night in the dining room and hope that makes a difference globally or, um, you know, outside of that, but it's not, um, um, something that we, you know, are actively promoting or, you know, it's a special thing what happens in, 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 you know, it's hard. So like, what is a celebrity chef? Like Thomas is a celebrity chef, but he hasn't really done anything to become a celebrity chef. It's just because he's popular, I guess. I mean, he's never done TV (laughs) shows or cooking shows or, um, Iron Man or, um, you know, um, what's the, you know, Bobby Flay, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Chopped. (laughs) Um, so, but he is, I mean, you know, he's a celebrity chef, but, um, you know, how do you define that or what, who defines that, I guess, but we're just kind of like doing our own thing and hoping people take notice. And obviously people do, I mean, um, you know, we have a, a, a really great following and, but it's nothing, we're not trying to, um, um, you know, throw it out there right okay well i i want to um dive in a little bit more about how the the wine program has developed over time but before we do that can we talk quickly about um per se for a little bit i want to basically kind of you i guess what it is how how did how did you how did the team develop the one that was going to be opening the restaurant? And then, um, yeah, a little bit about your time there since you spent 10 years. Yeah. I mean, basically we, this was, um, a massive undertaking for, for us, Thomas, Laura, everyone, um, you know, chef Keller had been in New York before he had a restaurant called Raquel. It was on Varick down in the village. And I think, I believe it's a YMCA mm-hmm. now or a, a boys and girls club. It's not a restaurant anymore. Um, but he was partnered there with Serge Raul, and um, that's where the name c- comes from, R-A from Raul, and then K-E-L from Keller, um, Raquel. And then mm-hmm. that ended up, um, it didn't survive the recession of the late 80s. Um, so they ended up closing that restaurant. And and so 
um, you know, Thomas has always wanted to to make a return to New York, and it's hard to return to New York. I mean, the time we the time we went to New York, um, you know, Alain Ducasse had just opened up at the Essex House, and it, you know, I mean, it was an incredible restaurant. I mean, one of the best meals I've ever had, and you know. New Yorkers are very um, protective of their city and it's hard for someone from the outside to come in, um, you know, and, and do that. And and I feel like they had a, they had a tough time welcoming Alain Ducasse. So um, were they going to have a tough time, you know, welcoming us? And I mean, we're different, but still, I mean, Thomas, Chef Keller was, um, you know, 2004 French Laundry is one of the top restaurants. We won the world's 50 best in 2001, 2002. And, and so, you know, we're kind of, um, you know, just coming into this project. And then the project itself is this massive billion dollar building, Time Warner Center. Um, mm-hmm. So there was a lot of, there was a lot on the line for us. So we made the decision to close the French Laundry and and bring out the team from the French Laundry to kind of indoctrinate or um, open per se. Um, that was the plan. So it was right. about 40 of us who came out. Uh, we, we were here and we trained the staff. We hired the staff. We trained the staff, um, you know, and then we um, and then we opened and then four days later, five days later, we had the fire and then um, we had to close for another couple months. (laughs) So we did it all over again. Two months later, we hired more people and retrained and, um, and opened, you know, it was a great time. And, and, um, can you share it? Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say, can you share a little bit more about, about that fire? I, we briefly touched on it um, back with Andre, but uh, that it sounds like a crazy, crazy. Yeah, experience. it was a, it was a, a Saturday. It was um, in between lunch and dinner. Um, I, I remember noticing I, I, I had been really working on the. There's a, there was a wood burning fireplace in the dining room there, and I had been working on um, the fires since we opened. I was always the guy kind of throwing the logs on and and whatnot. And um, I went. I remember going back in the kitchen. I, st- I started seeing smoke come out of the. Um, there was smoke coming out of the um, light fixtures. So, you know, <laughs> something wasn't right. And, and, you know, we called and next thing you know, you know, the um, New York fire department was, was there and, and they were kind of trying to figure out what was going on. And eventually they took their um, pickaxes and, and threw them into the wall. And as soon as oxygen got in there, it was like, just flames everywhere in the back of the kitchen. And, um, you know, it was a, the oh, building man. was brand new. So, you know, we have this, like, I don't even know how it's been half a million dollar bone stove just, just installed. It was craned in through the, the window, the fourth, fourth story window. Cause it wouldn't fit in mm-hmm. any doorway. <laughs> and, and I remember the firemen connecting their hoses and, turning the water on and just like dousing that stove because it was so hot and the radiant heat was coming off of it and the gas Mm -hmm. was off, but it was still like really hot (laughs) and they just doused all their water on the stove. And I was like, Oh my gosh, Uh, just to, just to put the heat out. (laughs) And then they, and then they went after the fire and um, you know, it was like, so the water, I don't know if it had been, you know, but the water was like, it looked like iced tea. It was so brown. Um, and, and they, they put oh, the fire out and, and I remember leaving that day. I thought we'd be closed for a couple days, but, um, sure enough, we were closed for two months. Smoke damage. I had no idea how, how bad smoke damage could be. The, the whole restaurant smelled so bad for like weeks. Yeah, wow. 
I can imagine. And were, was there anybody in, like uh, any customers, any guests at the time? Yeah, there were a few. Um, they didn't really know what was going on. We were kind of like in, in getting everybody out from lunch, just finishing up lunch. So they were leaving. We hadn't opened yet for dinner. Yeah. So we um, uh, we were kind of in that in-between time. And, you know, then we closed. And then we reopened um, in May after the fire. Yeah. And then, so how, how was there, so there were 40 of you that came from the French laundry. Obviously I couldn't stay closed forever. So did, was, how did you guys decide on the contingent that was going to stay and stay on in, in New York and kind of build it to what it is today? You know, that's a good question. I mean, you know, we, we, um, you know, I felt like, I mean, that was, that, that was very, that was probably the, the, one of the most, um, difficult years just as far as work goes, it's a lot of work because we, we basically reopened per se twice. And then we had a, then we had to go back and reopen French laundry. So French laundry had been closed for six months. So um, it was like <laughs> reopening the French laundry because it was like a, a whole new staff there as well. And so, um, right. you know, when you close for six months, you, 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 you lose people for sure. Um you know, you, you'd like to say that you're going to keep everybody and it's just not the reality of the situation. Um, and, and so we started over again at the French laundry. And, um, so I, I left New York in May of Oh four kind of end of May to come back to French laundry. And we, you know, we, we have a new pastry chef, a new chef de cuisine. Um, you know, uh, Laura was still the general manager. Larry, our longtime maitre d', was here, and that was about it. Um, um, you know, the, the sommelier team was still in New York. Um, Andre was 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 there. He's head sommelier at, at Per Se, and Paul Roberts was was kind of like beverage director. So he was really at French Laundry, you know, doing the day to day stuff until we found a sommelier here and. and um, you know, that was that was a tough summer. And then what happens, lo and behold, on a Saturday night, you look out at the French Laundry and there's Frank Bruni waiting in the courtyard to have dinner at the French Laundry. And you're like, what is going on? Like, why is he at the <laughs> French Laundry? You know, we we had all been on the lookout for him right. because, you know, he's he's going to review per se at some point. Um, but we weren't really I don't think I mean, none of us were really expecting him to come to to come to the French laundry. Uh, but sure enough, there right. he was. And so he, he had dinner at the French laundry <laughs> and then he had a reservation. He had reservations at per se three days later. So uh, we thought it'd be fun. I waited on him here at, at French laundry and then they flew me back to wait on him at per se. So I waited on him here and then two <laughs> days later at per se kind of um, just to kind of have fun with him. How did you guys um, know he was? How did you know he was going to go to Per Se that quickly? After we I, we had a bunch of we had you know b names, aliases, all the you know all the the, the restaurant community <laughs> you know mm -hmm. shares. So we 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 were pretty confident he was he was having dinner at Per Se that night. Um, but we didn't you know I mean it, uh, no one was expecting him at the French Laundry. So, and that was, you know, that was like such a cool time to right. like hunting the critic. I mean, those days may be over to be honest, like, you know, it's it just, it's just not the same anymore it, 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 with um, social media, TikTok, Instagram. I mean, the, 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 the day of the critic is almost, you know, and now they don't even like rate. There's like no ratings. Some, you know, the, 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 they just write a story or write an article. Um, so, I mean, it could be the last, um, you know, 11 Madison was going through it, French Laundry, a bunch of restaurants at that time. So it was, it was definitely exciting. And then that article came out and, yeah. um, you know, that was such a, a monumental, I mean, we were really, you know, we've never really been focused on those, kind of things we've always been focused on 
you know, just taking care of each other and, and trying to impress each other. And, um, by doing that, like if I, if I impress my colleague, you know, my expectations are higher than, um, you know, the food critic for the New York time, you know, the, all these people, I mean, I, I have, I have 30 years of, of, um, hospitality profession in me, culinary and dining, like I have very high expectations. And so if I, if somebody does something to me that impresses me, that's, that's what we're trying to go for. Like, you know, we want to impress each other. And then the guest obviously will be impressed. The the food critic easily will be impressed. Um, You know, so that's kind of our philosophy. And, you know, we never really like say like, Oh, we have to do this. We have to get four stars. We have to get three stars. We have, to, you know, and, in you know, all those accolades are great and they're all, um, you know, very humbling and flattering, but they're all for what you did yesterday. They're, they're none of them are for what you're going to do tonight or tomorrow. And that's what we're always focused on is, mm-hmm. you know, the next day, the next service, you know, five years from now, five minutes from now, all those, all those kind of things. And on that similar note, do you, have you seen the expectations of the customer or the diner or the guest, I guess, um, change over time, especially with like social media? Is it more just like people trying to come for clout to see that they're, they're there and just get a picture of a fancy wine bottle or are the expectations for the cuisine still where they were at the same time? Yeah, I I think that um, the expectations of the guests are extremely high. Um, at the French Laundry, it's not easy to to get a reservation, so you you have to already put in the effort to 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 get in here to to get the table to get the reservation. Um, you know, so you know we we get less people like that, that are just kind of like trying to come for social or post something, or, you know, they, they really want the experience. Um, they, they want to, you know, enjoy it. Um, they arrive early. Everybody arrives early at the French laundry and, and nobody leaves. They, it's, it's, they don't want to leave. They, <laughs> you, they don't want it to end, you know? So we're always, we're always trying to extend the guest experience as best we can. And, um, that's like always one of our, running primary goals and and you know so it's not like you know i mean i think maybe some people have that in their mind they want to come here and post at the french laundry um but it's an old stone building Mm -hmm. and it's hard to get wi-fi and so it's hard to post there (laughs) um and then they're like surprise you know they're like consumed with the magical evening they're having and they, they don't even realize they don't, before you know it, we've already taken them away. Yeah. That's the, that's the best kind of experience. Anyway, you're too distracted to even want to take a picture. So exactly. Cool. Well, so, so you spent 10 years at per se, it kind of got very well established and it kept going. Um, How, how did you make the transition into the dining room and then, um, what was it like coming back when you came back to the French Laundry in, in your time since? Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I was, was chefing, cooking, and ha- actually had a job set up in Paris at Lucas Carton, a three Michelin star restaurant there. And, and I, you know, cause I had worked all the stations in the kitchen and then it's like, okay, now what, you know? Um, I really didn't want to be a sous chef. It wasn't really something I was interested in. So I was going to continue my culinary, you know, uh, training, if you will. And I remember having a conversation with Chef Keller and, you know, I just told, I told him we were just talking about leaving and, you know, and I said, I said, you know, it's hard because I don't want to leave the restaurant and, um, um, you know, but I get it. I, I think I've run its course. And then we both started talking about the dining room and, you know, it's something I I never really thought about and, and, you know, f- having always been a cook. And then, 
um, you know, I, the next thing you know, I was like, well, maybe I'll work in the dining room for a little bit. And, and then I started doing that and immediately fell in love with it. Um, you know, and then I was really good at it. I wasn't expecting to be good. I was like <laughs> nervous at first and, um, but then it, it just seemed so natural. Um, you know, the whole aspect of it. And I was really good at still really good at making people happy. And, and, um, so I, I kept pursuing that side of it and I, I always, you know, kept trying new roles and, you know, I wanted to be the expediter and I was the expediter <laughs> and then, um, you know, I wanted to be a captain and, and then the next thing you know, I'm the general manager of the French laundry. And I, I would, you, I, if you were to tell me that 25 years ago, I would have said you were crazy for sure. For sure. <laughs> so what, what is just out of curiosity, I don't think a lot of people kind of have a full grasp on what that means. Like what, what is your kind of like day to day? I know the general manager manager does like everything, um, but kind of like give somebody a, a little sneak peek in the life of a general manager at the French laundry. Well, I, I tell you, it's kind of like two jobs. You have a administrative job that you, that you do during the day, that's nine to five. And then you close all that up and then you open a restaurant and then you're, you know, um, maitre d' diner manager from when we open at four o'clock till, you know, 11, 10, 30, 11, you know, till, till it winds down here. So, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, you know, I, I grew up in a restaurant, so I was always interested in how things work. And now I'm, you know, in a position where I can make things work and I can change things and I can play with things and um, move things around and, and, um, you know, find great people, train, teach, mentor. So I, I, mm. um, I'm incredibly lucky for sure. Yeah, that's, that sounds, sounds fantastic for somebody who like lives and breathes hospitality like you. Um, what, what would you say, like, I guess, are you communicating directly with guests or is that more like when you want to, or like, how are you, how, I guess, yeah. How does, how does that work? Um, or are you yeah, I, I communicate, I, I spend the majority of my time communicating with guests, whether it's phone, email, um, prior to, and then, um, you know, when they're here, the, you know, I, you know, I, I try to get to each table. Um, you know, obviously the people I know, it's easy. The people I don't know, I like to introduce myself and, and meet them and talk to them and hear their story, and, you know, share the, the evening with them. I think that one of the, the, best things we do here is we're very generous with our time and and that's a um yeah i mean it, 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 people take that for granted and i think to, to be generous with your time is is a is a is a very very great luxury in a restaurant of this that of this you know and yeah, thomas I think... too i mean when when thomas thomas is in town he's he goes to the dining room and says hello to everyone and um, talks to people and, and like people like can't believe it. They're like shocked. They're like, they can't <laughs> believe he's here, but he's like always here. Thomas is like always at the French laundry. He's, he's, I would say 90% of his time is spent here and we're incredibly lucky for that. Um, but just being able to, to go out and, and talk to the people I, I'm definitely front and center in, involved. I, I'm not behind the scenes. You know, I, yeah, I think that's, that's a, that's, that's a great. great way to, you know, I mean, to, to, if you're, if you're in the front line, you could see, you could see it in real time. Yeah, we, like, that's something that um I, I feel like Jeff Keller and I guess yourself have cultivated over the years, because that was something um Bobby mentioned, but then we also had um his wine director, Carlin, on um, as well, and she mentioned that was an essential part of her. So I feel like that's, that's, that's such an important piece of really building that experience. Like you were talking about earlier. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I agree. Well, transitioning, I guess, 
since we haven't really touched much on the wine part, then not that we have to really, but I'm, I'm just kind of personally curious. So since your time there, it's transitioned, you guys didn't really have a sommelier. Uh, I believe when, you, when they did come on, it was a little bit more of a California centric wine list. And then over the years it's evolved. Um, can you describe kind of how it's evolved and what it is, what your wine list is kind of like today? Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, we're always California centric. I mean, we're, we're, we, we are a three Michelin star restaurant in the heart of the Napa Valley and just pulling from those great uh, Michelin starred restaurants in, in France, uh, Burgundy, even Italy, you know, the, the, um, the, the wine list, um, you know, we could take, take La Cote d'Or in, in, in Burgundy that they have, they have a, a world list too, but they have the best Burgundy list, right? They, they, they have the Burgundy. Mm -hmm. And so the French laundry is like that for Napa Valley. Like we want to start with one of the most amazing collections you can have in Napa Valley. And then from that, right. You know, what else, what else do our guests want? You know, Bordeaux, white burgundy, uh, champagne, of course, um, you know, Spain, Australia, um, and then build it, build it through that. And then you have a restaurant that's been open for 30 years as, with Thomas almost 46 years in total. So you have built a collection of wine that is um, pretty incredible. Um, and, and it's yeah. never, no, that, that makes sense. you know, I mean, we've, we've definitely had sommeliers in, in before I was a GM and th those days are, are, we, you know, we've, we've made those mistakes in the past. And, you know, I feel like when you, you, you get a sommelier, sometimes they like to put their own personal touch on the wine list, you know, and we realize that it's, and, and so then you're left over with all this wine, right. That no one orders, right. You have this <laughs> like wine that um, you're never going to, you know, just because so-and-so thought it was like the, the, um, the wine of the moment, you know, whatever, 15 years ago. And, and now uh, you have three cases of it and you, you can't, you know, you just can't sell it. Um, so right. the, the philosophy <laughs> is definitely what do the guests want? What do the guests want to drink? What's important to to um, the restaurant? I mean, we have a we have a bunch of wines that are storied in us. Um, Vietti in, in Italy is a is a very powerful winery. That's where that's where Chef Keller first heard of the French Laundry. So we we support their wine. Um, and, and then, you know, obviously our partners, we have, uh, 48 investors in here in the French laundry, many of which have, have wineries. So we want to make sure they're well represented on our, our list. And then, um, you know, the organizational wines, Willie Chateau, Traditions and Qualité, we, we have their wines also. Um, but then it's pretty much the guests. I mean, the guests are great at telling you what they want and, um, you know, we're great at getting that information from them. And, um, you know, that's, that's very important. And, and, you know, I could tell you per se, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's different. You have different tastes there. You have, um, you know, California is not what people want to drink when they go to New York city. Um, uh, but I'll tell you here in Napa Valley, mm -hmm. everybody wants to, to have some Napa. They want to have some of the wine. That's why they're here. Um, so we want to make sure we have, you know, an extensive, and then the half bottle list too. We probably have the, the biggest selection of half bottles, I would say maybe in the world. Um, cause we're, we're part of our big part of our wine philosophy is not pouring a wine with every course. Um, I think, mm. or we think I should say, cause restaurants do it and they do a great job with it. But, but for us, um, you know, when you pour wine with every course, it just, it's just, it just becomes, it just becomes a lot of information and it, it becomes, um, a lot of, um, a lot of, of talking, a lot of sommelier lecturing, a lot of, um, of information that you may not have really asked for or wanted. Um, 
you know, so we're really, we're really focused on half bottles um, because then you could, then you could present the half bottle for, for a few courses, two or three courses, um, and then have a half bottle, you know, half bottle white, half bottle red, another half bottle red to finish. Um, and then you had three wines versus, you know, 16, 17 different wines, which I've had before. And then I, I don't, you know, it's just hard to, to pull back. I, I remember having a, a meal and they poured me 24 different wines. And the only one I remember was the, the Spanish water they poured with one course, you know, just cause it's just so much information. <laughs> um, right. You know, and then your palate gets totally fatigued and, um, you know, so then it's not about the guests at that point. Alone. Yeah. Your, your palate, your palate. And then it becomes, it was, I, I, you know, we feel that it's not, it's not really about the guests at that point. It's more about the sommelier. You know, it's like the sommelier is right. going to tell you how much he knows and give you all his knowledge, whether you ask for it or you don't. Um, so, yeah. you know, and we would it, rather, to, to your, our sommeliers are, are more like maitre d's that have incredible wine knowledge. That's awesome. And so they're here to, they're yeah, here to like shepherd you... them through the journey. And Bobby was yeah. the, you and know, I mean, you he's the like, patriarch of that. Do you think that's where that, that motto kind of started? I guess you guys yeah, have the I motto mean, Bobby, of guests Bobby first and like food centric. Bob yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, it was, it starts with Thomas and Laura, you know, conveying to Bobby their vision and then Bobby taking it and, and running with it. And, um, you know, and I say that to this day, like when I meet with people interviewing for sommelier or head sommelier or beverage people, you know, the most important thing is, is, is you know the guests and and um the restaurant it's it's never about the wine it's never about the food um i'm sorry it's never about the, the yeah. in, in those solely in those <laughs> moments you know it's about the to totality of the experience so we need to have a sommelier who's focused on the the meal um you know and that the, the analogy is the maitre d he's a he's a maitre d that has great wine knowledge you know, they could, they could, it's, it brings it much more relatable, you know, because first in so many restaurants and I've experienced this throughout, it's, it, it is, you know, the, the wine team operates like the Vatican city in, in Rome, they're like their own country and they have their own <laughs> set of rules and they have their own, you know, things they can do and can't do. And, um, and we don't want that. We want it to be a part of, we want it to be a part of the, the um, yeah. collective whole. Um, and then it's great for like training and mentoring. And I mean, we have so many people that get involved in the wine program that leave the wine program and come back to the dining room and vice versa. And, and, um, you know, I mean, Bobby would definitely blaze the trail for that. And, and then I think, you know, just all the people that have come after him have embraced it and embraced who was here before them. And, you know, made their own kind of marks on the, on the programs. Do you, um, where I don't want to take too much more of your time here. You've already been generous. Uh, you're good. I, I, I got all day. Think good. about it. <laughs> Great. Well then on the wine side, since your menu changes every day, but you do have a large seller, how do you guys come in with recommendations based on the day's menu or is it really up to the customer there? Yeah, I mean, we so we don't have a set wine pairing. That's um, a a big a big thing that we do here. It's is um, you know you, you you go to restaurants and they have the wine pairing. And this is the wine pairing, and 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 our our wine experience is more of a conversation. So you know we like to find out you know what the guest is because if you look in the kitchen, if you look at all the orders, they're all different. We have two menus. We have the chef's menu. We have the vegetable menu. We have the evolution menu. Um, um, so th there, there, there is really never a night where there's two tickets in the kitchen that are the same. So 
you know, why would the wines be the same then? You know, so we don't, we, we want to customize it. We want to personalize it. Um, you know, we want to, um, you know, make people give, give them things that they aren't expecting. Um, so it's, it's, it's more of a conversation and it's, it's a conversation of how much you want to drink, how much, you know, what's your budget, how much you want to spend. Um, you know, and then like things, do, things you like, things you don't like as far as wine, you know, just having that conversation. And, and it's, it's, um, it can be difficult to have those conversations, I think, you know, but for, for the French laundry, it's not, it's very, it's very open. It's very honest. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a good rapport. The guests are very excited to be here. They're, they're so happy. Um, they, they really will give whatever we ask of them. And, and, you know, so, so just in those moments, you share these conversations and you share these um, tidbits and you get this excitement and, and then you, you can go from there. And, and, and then it's 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 pretty easy at that point. I mean, if it's someone celebrating their fiftieth birthday, it's easy to find a birth year wine to slip in there. Things like that 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 aren't they they don't expect. Um, you know, I think I think those are the things that that set our wine program apart from others. You know, I, I it's easy to follow that sommelier pairing you know or they they pour you it's i feel like it's the same it's the same pairing sake and madeira and gruner you know but we want to kind of like make it <laughs> more personal and in um you know whether they had a, a, a they had a great trip to burgundy or they had a great trip to australia and 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 then you know finding a half bottle or a full bottle of something you know from from that region and, you know, that comes up in conversation, you know, but they're not really expecting it, but then they get it and they're just like so happy. So I, right. I think um, the, no, the personalization of our, of our wine experiences is, is, um, is, is what we excel at for sure. And then we have this massive inventory to pull from. So we have all these tools to, to pull from and, That's and it, you know, that's what makes, that's, that's what gets it exciting. And I mean, you know, you see the sommeliers that the sommeliers, they always come over and they say like, Oh, I just sold a bottle of Latash on table five. And I'm like, really? You sold the Latash, you know, like you, the gentleman <laughs> wanted central coast Pinot and you steered him into the Latash. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we have more conversation, we have more fun and, um, you know, we have all these great wines. Yeah. Do you guys I remember have Bobby, a large I remember, budget each year for just laying down? Yeah, wines? yeah, absolutely. We, we're very generous and, and, um, we have a, the, our budgets, um, you know, I mean, we, we have a specific range we want to keep it within. I mean, you can, you can buy, you can go crazy buying wine. Um, so we, we definitely have a, have a range that we want to keep it in and, you know, we'll present that with the sommelier and the head sommelier who currently is Andrew Adelson and, and, you know, and then it's really up to him. He, he, he can, you know, if he f f falls into the parameters of, in, of what we need and all of our head sommeliers have come through. So it's, it's, they really know what we want and what, what um, we're looking for and he's looking for. Um, so, I mean, it's a great, it's, yeah. a, it's, they're well, it's just, so it's interesting to think. It was, sorry to interrupt there. I was gonna say, it's interesting to think of a, a sommelier buying wines to lay down that maybe utilize when they're not even there anymore or like, you know, way down the line. Yeah. It's an interesting concept. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have our allocations. We, we, we keep those and, um, but you know, they, the, 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 the esoteric stuff, it's, it's not, we're not really like too, too crazy on esoteric stuff. Um, I mean, we'll pour it here and there, but I mean, there's, there's so much wine in there. We've like, can't, can't move from, sommeliers making poor decisions on what to buy 
what what they thought was going to be the next yeah. hot thing. Right. Well, so um, I guess like one cl- closing kind of question here. What do you think? Um, what is like one thing you would like people? Is there a common misconception about the French Laundry, or one thing you like think people should know that maybe they don't already when they're thinking about the French Laundry? Um, I, I, you know, I would think that I think the the, the common misconception is is uh, value. I mean, I think the French Laundry is one of the great values. It's always been um, um, a great value, and in, in as far as to the fine dining world around us, um, you know, the menu is expensive, um, for sure, but, um, you know, we're always, we've never been the highest price and, you know, we, we, our service is included here and, and that goes for the wine too. And, um, you know, but what you get here when you come and, and I mean, we don't take for granted how, how expensive it is or how, um, how much money or how much time and effort it takes to, to have a meal here. So um, we're, we're very protective of that time, that money. Um, and, you know, we really want everyone to, to you know, experience, um, you know, the, the, I wish we could share it with, you know, we only have 14 tables and um, I wish we could share it with more people, but that that's the, the tricky thing is the, the, how small it is, but you know, we, we do value everyone. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fantastic. Well, I think, I think that's a great overview of, of the French laundry and and what you do. So thank you so much for your time and I appreciate you coming on. You got it. Thanks, man. Come see us. Thank you. Bye. Oh yeah. Well, someday I hope. I hope to make the journey that is on tops of my list. So, all right. Thank you so much. Bye. You got it. All right. That was our interview with Michael Mignot from the French Laundry. That was quite, quite the interesting interview. I've always, I've always kind of wondered, you know, the, about the mythical place being, you know, the French Laundry and, and all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes there and, I've always heard so much about the hospitality and the focus, and it was really interesting to hear his, you know, the insider's kind of point of view on on how all of that comes together and their focus on the guests and how they make the little things special based on even just little conversations they have at the table. So I hope everybody enjoyed that. I hope everybody keeps it on your bucket list, whether you have been or it's your goal to go there and definitely go visit the French Laundry and, and Michael someday. But until next week, we'll be back with another episode. Until then, cheers. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular as amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.